It's been a little bit over a month since I did the unboxing video of this Canyon Ultimate CF SLX 8.0 DI2 model year 2020. It hit the US website a few months ago. There's a link below to that video if you haven't seen that yet and want to. But the weather's been warming up. I've had a chance to get this thing outside, uh, ride it on some different terrain. And so now I can comment a little bit more on how it actually performs. The second most important area of a bicycle, uh, performance wise, in my opinion, is actually how it looks and whether you think it looks good. So I've taken this thing around. I've got a lot of good compliments on it. And in fact, I was in a shop last weekend in Georgetown and I turned my back and some guy was trying to hop on it uh, just because I guess he liked it so much. Um, so it's doing well there. I like it. Um, I'm actually into the, the all black stealth kind of look on bicycles. So very happy with that. But the most important uh, aspects, features of a bicycle, in my opinion, much more than what components come on it, how much it weighs, how it performs in a wind tunnel, is just does it fit you properly? So as I've mentioned in my unboxing video, one of my main reasons for getting this particular bicycle was I wanted to uh, size down the frame from my size small air road so that I had a little bit shorter top tube just because I felt I'd ridden some rental bikes uh, over, over the couple of years since I've had the air road and felt actually a little bit more comfortable with a shorter top tube. Um, I immediately noticed the difference from that. I'm more comfortable. I can stay in the drops more. Um, I feel more in control of the bike. So all of these are good. All of these translate into putting more power and going faster overall. So that's been a win. One of the other things that I noticed fit wise on this, I made another video. Uh, I'll put a link below to that as well, asking how Canyon measures the width of their cockpits, because this was the specifications for the extra small was it was supposed to come with a 390 by 90 cockpit, just like my size small air road did. And when I got it, I thought, okay, they look definitely more narrow than the others. Um, and it turned out that when I measured them, they definitely are, they're two centimeters more narrow. And you immediately notice that when you get out of the saddle that, oh my gosh, I'm missing, missing two centimeters is actually turns out it's quite a lot in the width of handlebars. But uh, I quickly got used to it. Um, in the end, I actually like the narrow handlebars more. Uh, so I, it's okay. Um, I like the ones that came on it. But um, so the first ride that I did on this bike, it's an all arounder bike. Um, to me, that means it's a bike that's made for riding up mountains. So I took it to one of my favorite mountains around here for my first ride, for my second ride outdoors on it. I took it to another mountain around here for my third ride. I took it to a different side of the first mountain. And finally, I've been riding it a little bit more around here in the Washington DC area on some of the bike paths and the roads just to see how it performs on um, less than perfectly smooth asphalt. So I'll talk first about in the mountains, um, obviously it is a, it's a super stiff, lightweight bike. I feel like I'm not losing any power on this thing. Um, that's really good. The, uh, the aerodynamics on the downhill, uh, integrated cockpit, the tube shape, I feel like maybe that's performing well. But one of the things I was surprised about was this bike is a full pound. So four or 500 grams, something in there lighter than both my Air Road and I had a Trek and Monda before that. Uh, that weighed about the same as the air road. So this is a pound lighter. So yeah, it should go faster uphill than those bikes. But I noticed even from the first ride on, on roads that I've been on a lot of times, I was going faster downhill on this and that kind of surprised me. But then when I thought about it, I realized, oh, this is actually, your body is maybe 80% of the air resistance anyway. So the fact that I have a better fit on this bike, um, coupled with that fit makes me more confident on those roads. I don't feel like I'm stretched out, so maybe I'm a little twitchy uh, on the front wheel. I'm going faster downhill on a lighter bike, so that's a pleasant surprise. Um, so in the mountains, it's been generally a pleasure. Uh, around here on some bumpier roads on bike paths, um, you know, maybe the narrower handlebars help me squeeze between people a little bit more easier. I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, it goes over bumps pretty well. I feel like it absorbs vibration. Something that they did about putting the bolt of the seat post really far down here, it actually has a little bit of flex from this. So that's kind of nice. Um, there is a, a little bit of a rattle inside. I, I determined it's one of the DI2 wires. I'm not sure I'll ever be able to do anything about that. So it's just a rattle that comes when I hit a bumpy road. Um, not a big deal as long as I can not pay attention to it. Once I got this bike, 
brand new. I upgraded three different components on it um, and then put two different accessories on. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about where I ended up. Uh, one of the upgrades that I did to it was actually the saddle. Uh, this is the saddle that came on it. This is uh, definitely the cheapest way that you can save 100 grams on a bike. Um, just uh, you know, a basic uh, carbon saddle. It fits me just fine. It's, it makes it a lot lighter, um, but I don't necessarily ride it all the time just because that's not necessarily as comfortable as this on bumpy terrain. Um, I upgraded the tires as well. Uh, there were some Schwalbe's that came on it. These are Continental GP 5000s. These, they supposedly roll about the same. Uh, these are lighter as well, so if they roll the same and they're lighter, um, obviously I'm going to pick these unless there was some sort of grip trade-off, but actually the tread pattern looks really similar between the two. The other component that I upgraded from what came on it, uh, the cassette that's here, you can tell by the two-tone of metal that's back there, is this is a Dura-Ace cassette. I mostly did that um, because I was, I was getting another wheel set anyway and had to buy a new cassette, um, and so I thought, well, if I'm getting that, I might as well get one that's uh, will save a little bit of weight, uh, particularly in the size 30 cassette. It's pretty substantial, the difference between the Ultegra and the Dura-Ace um, if you're trying to be a uh, weight weenie, in which case I was because um, one of the things that the bike doesn't come on when you weigh it, of course, is pedals. Um, these are amazing power pedals, by the way. Maybe I should do a separate video of those. But uh, so these add 300 grams to your bike, plus you have the Garmin and mount. And so I was trying to see if I could offset those and keep it under seven kilograms even. I definitely did not. I ended up with uh, seven kilograms and 10 grams. So I don't know where I'm gonna shave 10 grams off. I'll have to figure that one out over time. But um, the other accessories that I put on here, obviously some bottle cages that match, nothing special about those. This is actually something interesting for people to consider. So this is a, uh, Kenyan didn't have the specialized Garmin mounts. Um, they were out of stock in the US store. So I got a K Edge at their recommendation. This is just a flat, piece of, I think it's metal. Um, if I had screwed the K-Edge directly on to the uh, the cockpit here, it actually was making the, making the Garmin kind of sit up at an angle. So it was kind of sitting like this, like not exactly that extreme, but it was definitely tilted up a little. And I thought I was used to, I wanted my Garmin to sit exactly flush uh, with, with the cockpit there. So what I ended up doing was I went to a hardware store I just got some longer screws and a nut to keep it um, to keep it stuck out as it is. So it's mounted on there a little bit at an angle to the cockpit, but it makes it flat to me. So I think that that ended up making it better. So a lot of the questions that I've been getting about this bike are both about the components that come stock on it, those that I didn't change out for something else, and then the components that I chose versus other things. So I want to talk about two of those really quickly. That's the wheels and the brakes. The wheels that came on it, Reynolds AR41, uh, full carbon, 41 millimeters deep. Uh, I addressed in the unboxing video, they're wider. I think they're at least 25 millimeters wide, noticeably wider um, outside than most other, uh, most other wheel sets that I have, um, which is both more comfortable. They say maybe there's aerodynamic benefits, rolling resistance benefits. I like them. One of the downsides that I noticed on my first ride was that when I got out of the saddle, I was having some brake rub. Um, and so I contacted Reynolds about it. They told me just tighten the quick release. I don't know if that actually did anything. Um, I ended up loosening the brake caliper just a couple of millimeters, but enough so that I have to pull the lever a little bit more before I get full, uh, full engagement and braking force starting on it. I'd previously ridden with my brakes pretty tight because I, if I'm riding from the hoods, I would not want to pull it very much. Uh, it turned out not only did I find that there really wasn't a, a safety downside to opening the brake caliper just a little bit from here, um, is I felt like that having a little bit more swing on the lever has actually let me modulate the braking better than I was doing before. Um, so maybe I'll kind of ride a bike better from having a more flexible wheel. But um, as far as the component itself, uh, I've been reading up on this and it sounds like that there's a maximum tension that a spoke can have on it if it's gonna go into carbon. And so having a shallower carbon rim, even if it's just 10, 20 millimeters less than a 50 or 60 millimeter rim, it means that this probably is just a little bit more, the spokes are a little bit more flexible. And so if this is perfectly stiff, these are more flexible, you're gonna get a little bit of side to side. So you just open this up, it's not really a big deal. Um, and in my case, it actually helped me brake better. 
But on the subject of breaks, uh, many people ask me, hey, it's 2020, didn't you get the memo from two years ago that everyone rides disc brakes now? Um, no, I didn't. And one of my main reasons for continuing to get a disc brake bike and actually choosing this bike was that there are many manufacturers now that say that any of their high-end frame sets, they're only offering in disc brake, which I find kind of crazy and limiting your market, but hey, I don't run a business. Um, to me, compatibility is a big thing. I have more than one bike, and so I like being able to take you know, this bike off of my indoor trainer and put another bike on it without changing the side things. I like the fact that I can swap wheels out. That's the same reason that I actually tend to keep within the same, uh, roughly same group set types. So they're all Shimano right now. Um, even the cassette sizes is uh, either 30s or 28s, which don't tell anyone, but uh, even the old Ultegra, if it's, uh, it's rated for up to a 28 cassette, you can actually ride a 30 on there. Just don't do too much on the smallest, uh, the most inside cog. But um, compatibility is really big for me. I'm also not convinced in the performance benefits of disc brakes over rim brakes. Um, some of that has to do with when I look at the Pro Peloton and I see the teams that have bigger budgets and can resist what their sponsors are trying to push on them and say, hey, you know, ride this more so people will like this. Um, some of the bigger budget teams are still on rim brakes, even teams that are really performance based, uh, teams that would be winning grand tour stages in the mountains, even up and downhill. So if there was actually such a great benefit, why are they still riding rim brakes? It's a question that has to be asked. Um, but then at my level, I'm not a professional rider. Um, I find the, the thing that I worry the most about when I'm going down a hill or when I want to brake, uh, even at a stoplight, um, it's not, is my brake going to be able to stop this wheel? It's, is my tire going to maintain contact with the road? Am I braking too hard? So the idea that I would need more forceful brakes to me doesn't really make sense until I'm at a situation to where my tires are just, there's no way that I'm going to be able to make this thing skid. I'm not quite there even riding with, if I go to 25 or 28 tires, I still think that there's a lot of situations where I'd, I'd worry a little bit more about traction than I would about braking power. So that's why I chose these things. So after about a month and having the opportunity to ride this thing inside, outside on a lot of different terrain, uh, my final conclusion on this bike is I like it and I really don't have anything but positive to say. The components that came on it are all, of course, of a pretty high quality. Um, Shimano is well known. Reynolds is well known. Uh, Physique, I like this saddle, but I can do the gimmicky thing of trying to save two seconds on a 20 minute climb by switching this thing out when the time comes to do some KOM hunting. Yeah, I can do that, but this bike overall, the most important thing is it fits me really well, that makes me comfortable, that helps me put power out, and that's a good bike.